Donc l'objet de mon intervention, so my intervention will deal with the places where the Jewish Sonder Commandos worked in Auschwitz. And I'll get into more detail about the gas chambers indirectly and about the uh, crematorium furnaces in a more direct manner. Je vais pas faire un exposé, uh, descriptif. It's not going to be a description, uh, vais, uh, but instead, sur des, des types de I will rely on a, a number of speeches that we can hear a, a number of descriptions that can be found to analyze them, because when there is a description, the readers could say, oh, you say this about the crematoriums and about the uh, gas chambers, but there are other historians with other descriptions. And I'm a professor of history, so this is a clear problem in terms of uh, passing on uh, the le, knowledge. Le so this is a question I want to raise. The first question is to be able to address a large number of people, a very varied audience, and to be able to uh, describe Auschwitz to a number of students, of course, that are uh, ready to accept anything, but also to engineers, to electricians, to builders, to chemists, to a whole array of people without at no time, with, at no time uh, raising doubts in their minds. I don't want them to think, no, this is not accurate technically or naturally. This is not an accurate description. And the first sentence of Polyakov's book on Auschwitz, Auschwitz is not a dream. The second thing, French biologist François Jacob, Nobel Prize, who passed away last month, who said, I don't like the division between two cultures, the culture, the literary culture and the scientific culture. I don't like seeing them split up. And oftentimes, scientists have this division. But my experience is that of a book reader, and I can make the comparison with that of a director or a photographer that is zooming onto the picture. And you know that once you zoom onto the picture, it becomes blurry. So you need to adjust on the central focus. You can focus and then go back, and then all of your pictures will be neat. And here, the focus, according to a very Cartesian method, is to first thoroughly look into crematorium furnaces and gas chambers in order to have a very thorough and logical um, debate, especially when it comes to chronology, it needs to be always accurate, credible, not to mix up SS men with Zonderkommando men, not uh, see SS soldiers being um, tangled up with the uh, Arbeitsjuden. We hear sometimes from some books that the Arbeitsjuden were uh, making the Treblinka work. This is totally inaccurate. So let's not make magic. Let's make chemistry here. It has to be precise and accurate. I will only give two examples regarding the gas chambers, an indirect and a more direct example about crematorium furnaces. So maybe there is some confusion between the death camps and the concentration camps. It's a very famous uh, confusion that has been made. Here, this is a plan published by the Bild newspaper, a tabloid in Germany. This plan was published in 2008, and it was well known of those interested in Auschwitz 
And when you look at the uh, general map of the building, experts at least can recognize a building that is still existing in Birkenau. It's the uh, it's the reception building for the new rivals. The undressing room, in the middle you have the showers, on the right the dressing room, and this is where they receive the first shock. This is what all the uh, former detainees of Birkenau here. This is where they are uh, undressed, tattooed, and their heads are shaven off. So while they do this, their clothes go into a room where uh, the clothes are uh, cleaned of their uh, flea and lice. And this is particular to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, the German chambers call, uh, call, them, uh, call, them, uh, call these rooms lice cleaning rooms. This document is issued in New York in 1989. It's a book by Jean-Claude Pressac, and it comes from Auschwitz archives, whereas the first document comes from Berlin. But it's no surprising to know that there are archives both in Berlin and in Auschwitz. So the document already existed 25 years before it was published by BILT. And the journalists working for BILT asked for an interpretation, but not to the Auschwitz Museum, which should have been done. Instead, they asked it to the direction of uh, um, federal archives in Berlin. So this map has been published in all newspapers in Europe. This is the, the text that was written by AFP. It's a fantastic discovery, which clearly shows the evidence of the systematically planified genocide of Jews of Europe. And this is clearly a gas camera, a gas chamber. And the next year, when the documents were given to uh, Israel, the Jerusalem Post said these maps show a gas chamber that was never built. So once again, this is an example where high-level experts, uh, we're talking about Yad Vashem as well, Yad Vashem does not see reality. They only see what they expect to see. They see a gas chamber where there is none. And this reminds me of the experts of the Degako. Uh, trial. Degaco was the architect of the gas chambers and all and the crematorium furnaces. This uh, trial took place in Vienna in 1972, and the experts didn't see the gas chambers where they were, and the Yako was therefore uh, cleared. In France, a dictionary appeared in 2009, it was published in 2009 made a French and Belgian uh, text by French and Belgian authors in which there is a description of Auschwitz that does not match what you see when you're actually visiting Auschwitz. And I spoke to its publisher, Yerushka, and she took care of all the French-speaking publications in France, in Canada, and in uh, Belgium. And she said, why did they not uh, come to Auschwitz? Why did they not check? Why did they not ask you? And Charles Péguy, French writer and poet, in 1910, when we were young, he says, we have to describe what we see, and the most difficult is to see what we see, that is to have a clear look on gas chambers, a look based on scientific knowledge. And something that can be explained with a, a purely historical point of view. 
Second thing, the example in the brochure, this little textbook of the uh, Air Force Museum. Alors dans, dans ce livre, il y a d'abord des remerciements à Jean-Claude Pressac, à la famille de Jean-Claude Pressac. Uh, Jean acknowledgements est un to Jean-Claude Jean Pressac, un français, a French pharmacist, et il est remercié d'avoir permis que, acknowledged après and sa mort, for ce qu'il avait fait, les archives agreeing de la for the archives of the Atop to come back to Erfurt after Mais, his death. Le, le livre n'explique pas pourquoi. But the book does not say why. The company's archives, the company that created and built those uh, uh, furnaces and the ventilation were at the hands of a French pharmacist. Why did these archives come into the hands of that guy? Why was there no historian, European or American, that decided it would be maybe a necessary for these archives to be in the hands of the public and not just in the hands of an individual, and that there was serious work that could be carried out based on these archives. And I wish Presac hadn't died before he wrote the book he had the intention of making, because at least scientifically he would have been very thorough, but maybe from a historical point of view he would have been very bad, as he was a very bad historian and a very bad teacher. There is a book on Atov from Andres Ruller, Industrie und Holocaust. I only read the presentation to this book, but it's in German. And in the presentation, there is a mistake on the Auschwitz uh, mapping. The picture is toxic because it's published in several books and especially in a school textbook, a baccalaureate um, preparation, history preparation book, and it joins the negationist theories with, uh, again, this uh, argument on the uh, lice cleaning room. Entre les, but the main thing are the relationships Atop. between the staff of ATOP and the SS of Auschwitz. What did ATOP uh, create in Auschwitz? Et, et fait, le sujet. And this is not, never le sujet the exactly. topic On est that is sur les dealt with. Sur les à gaz. It's never about crematorium Alors, furnaces. Le, it's le never about gas chambers. So I'll read you the first paragraph to this brochure. Uh, On the internet, you can find the introduction, so you'll be able to check whether my translation is good. That's how it starts. On one very windy day, between the fall 1943 and the fall of 44. It's the story, the imagined story, of a German school teacher called Marianne Busch, and she goes home, and the cleaning lady is uh, finishing her work, and the apartment is covered with dust. She says it's like cigar ash all over my desk, white, grey flakes of, of cigarettes all over the house. And she asks, what is this? And the cleaning lady said, the wind comes from the camp there, they're still burning burning people in the crematorium. These are human ashes. It's not the first time it happens. So this is one of the descriptions of the uh, impact of the crematorium furnaces of Auschwitz. This uh, school teacher was uh, living maybe three, four, five kilometers from, from Birkenau. And when I read this, it reminded me of a book of Miguel Tregenza on the T4. Tregenza mentions Brandenburg and Grafenex crematoriums. It's crematoriums made by Cori, another firm from Berlin. And he mentions the flames stemming from the fireplaces, uh, chimneys of uh, the crematorium, and he says that the countryside is, is uh, invaded by smells of burnt 
bodies, flesh, burnt hair, burnt uh, fat. So Tregenza is describing Belzec. He's a specialist of Belzec, and this is at least my uh, theory. He is maybe describing what is happening. Maybe the uh, crematorium furnace technology uh, wasn't familiar to him. At least that's what comes out of this description. So I will not answer anything to this paragraph on the ashes. There's a technical question, but this at least is a map of the eastern part of the Auschwitz camp. On the left is the camp, and the little square at the bottom is the uh, commander's villa, and there's three barracks. There are the commandantur, the administration, and the hospital for the SS. Uh, there you see the crematorium. I'm not sure you can see. On the other side, across the road, all the SS troops' uh, barracks. There is also the uh, Anleitung, which is the uh, residence of the architects of Auschwitz. There is even a kindergarten. And at the heart of the uh, administration, you see that there is a plan for a huge crematorium. This is a plan that came from Berlin, because you see it's uh, signed by Vivid H.A., the central administration of Berlin, that decides upon what is being uh, done at Auschwitz. This huge crematorium will be built in Birkenau, but one cannot imagine a crematorium spreading ashes all over the place. So, a few words now on the uh, furnaces, furnaces from our top. You have uh, three different pits, three different incinerators in each uh, furnace. What I'd like to mention is that those crematoriums are divided into two parts. You have the, the pit where you put the body, and another part where you see G1 and G2 on the right, and you see that it means generator, that is translated by um, uh, the, f the fire. There are lots of uh, pictures of these uh, plans in DVDs and films, but these parts are never shown. There is one exception, it's a DVD-ROM uh, directed by Matteo Lopezetti in 2000, where the virtual camera goes around the furnace to show uh, first the pit where the body is, and the second thing is the hearth. The area of fire. So this is a cut coming from the crematorium number one. At the bottom, you see uh, the pipes going to the uh, chimney. They are not accurately represented. But you see the two parts that represent the work of the Zonda commander. On the right, you have the hearth, the hearth where you put first coke, and it falls into the bottom part. It's a coke hearth. And you need for the furnace to go up to 800 degrees. And when it reaches 800 to 900 degrees, the members of the commando in charge of this work put the corpse in the higher part of the pit, and you see Entführung, Entführung, 
which is the uh, door through which the bodies are introduced. And when the ashes fall down in the bottom part of the pit, uh, they burn in order to finish combustion. And then another part of the Zonda Commando removes the ashes, and you read Entnamatur, which is the door through which you remove the ashes, and then the ashes are thrown into the many ponds and lakes that are located around Birkenau. Some visitors thought it came from the chimneys of the crematoriums. I didn't think anyone can think this, but Clearly, they came from the dans, dans ash uh, drawers of the furnaces. But people thought differently. What you also read in the brochure is that uh, the uh, bad use of the tools used by the Zonda Commando created damage into the installation. But this seems to be totally made up. Because at the end of the cremation, the members of the Zonda Commando in charge of the furnaces have to clean the furnaces, have to remove the ashes. And if the machines break down, which has always been the case in the crematorium number one, where the chimney almost fell over the uh, Gestapo's barracks, it had to be circled with iron. And in crematorium number two, in June 1943, the furnaces had to be stopped because in this map, you don't see what could happen, but it happened in the chimney. There was an issue in the chimney, which you can't see on this map. And the tubes leading to the chimney were not equipped properly with the right bricks. And there was therefore a meeting between the SS, the ATOP, and the company that built uh, these fireplaces called Kohler, and they all argued in order to uh, decide for who would have to pay for uh, fixing this damage, who was responsible for it. So this enables you to understand facts about Auschwitz. And finally, and I don't have any special element on this, but those under commandos taking care of the furnace can uh, um, temper with the furnace, because every time there's a cremation, the oven temperature, the furnace temperature always goes up. But the problem is uh, you have to always um, take this temperature lower, otherwise it goes too high up. So if they leave this temperature increasing, of course the, the chimney might uh, be damaged, or at least the, the pipes of the chimney will uh, be destroyed. <coughs> so this happens in crematorium 4 and crematorium 5. This happens very often in all crematoriums of Birkenau. One last remark on this. This generator term has been creating lots of uh, confusion. Thirty years ago, George Weller wrote che uh, gas chambers did exist. George Weller was a chemist. He didn't understand anything to the Auschwitz map, but he asked for uh, an expert's help. But the expert got it all wrong. He didn't understand what the gas chamber was, the gas chamber called Fab Gasun Keller. Kemmler in Berlin described the uh, pit number one of crematorium two. But for us, clearly, it's the gas chamber, Gasun Keller. But the expert didn't understand. He mixed up the gas chamber gas with the furnace. And there was a big confusion from this point. 
the expert said these uh, generators were meant to uh, provide fuel, the fuel in gas, the furnaces, but I didn't understand what it meant. Are they working on coke or are they working on gas? So then could it be gas taken out of coke? That's possible, but it's really complicated. So. According to this map of uh, crematoria number two, that is very well known, every time it's been published in France or reproduced in the French book, we saw that Vela's expert said it seems to be obvious that the rectangles located in the gaps between the crematoriums show where the uh, generators Sit. So these little uh, squares would be the generators, the, uh, the coke hearth. <coughs> it doesn't mean anything, but many authors just copied this without even understanding. No one can understand this anyway, it's clearly inaccurate, but no one uh, said anything. And this is just one example. And in the history of Auschwitz, published by the Auschwitz Museum in five volumes, in the Polish, German, and English versions, the word Cox Generator is turned into gas generator. So I don't understand why gas translates cock. This is what happened, even for historians, but this goes back to a long time ago, back in Avella's time. So this has been corrected in the French version, but not in the other version. That means that the translators and proofreaders in Germany and the United States did not double check and didn't uh, pick up on this. And I'll finish with two pictures. First of all, a, an advertisement from Atop from the early 30s. Se, se the top was boasting about fait, caring for the dignity of its members. And before the strengthening of the year legislation of 1934, they had already created crematoriums, furnaces that were clearly the expression of the respect for uh, the dead. They claimed a huge respect for the for dead people. They said no noise, no smell, and no smoke. This is what they advertised for. This is a photography of crematorium number two of Birkenau. And when you see those photographs, you can really understand what uh, historians uh, overlooked. Here you see a kind of neoclassical temple that respects corpses, respects the dead, built by engineers and by uh, workers, factory workers. And this, in, when you look closer, you see a barbarian. Uh, devilish uh, temple that is cremating victims. So clearly, the top has given up on its professional ethics, but it's not giving up on its competency, its technical competency. So if we talk about industrialization, it's just the implementation of a technique. Maybe I can make one last remark. French Railways, the SNCF, the National uh, Railway Company, they also had a professional ethics, but they were uh, transporting people in coaches and uh, animals and uh, goods in carriages. But when they were asked to uh, carry people in uh, cattle carriages, there was a shift of this ethics, and still they didn't seem to have said anything about this. So maybe it's comparable to uh, the top's attitude, their professional ethics.
un, un just, historien, mais euh, au-delà, c'est plus de l'histoire. Et ce n'est plus de l'histoire. Et de faire des avec euh, des structures infernales qui échappent à la technique. Ce n'est uh, un inferno. Ce n'est plus possible, fire, mais ashes. on glisse ainsi dans There le discours qui est de l'ordre de l'imagination. Et dimension moi, and the imagination dimension. And as a professor of history, I can no longer tell engineers, I can no longer la, la tell other than students what happened. People think in Auschwitz, Auschwitz is not an epic event. Uh, a momentum of a massacre. There are many stories like this, even in the Bible. One event becomes a legend and is exaggerated. But this is not what happened with Auschwitz. What happened in Auschwitz wasn't an exaggeration of a particular event, no. That's it. Thank you.